and comments from, from the public, and then Laura will have a time to uh, react. Unfortunately, I don't know your name, so I just can't <laughs> point. <laughs> um, yeah, I wondered if you could consider, because the investment behavior is so deviant between the data and your model, and yeah. it seems like you could explore the Justiniano's idea of this marginal efficiency to, of investment shock. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned that, because that, that proved very useful in work I did with uh, Jonathan Eaton and uh, Brent Nyman, where we needed a kind of real shock that would move investment spending around. Uh -huh. uh, and, and maybe it feels too easy, and yet it, it was kind of striking in your pictures where you want something that makes you, suddenly you don't want to invest. It's not so much that you lost capital, it's that you realize right then if you invested, you probably wouldn't get very much, so. Okay, thank you, three over there. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> it seems to me that you are endowing your agents with a very inefficient technology to estimate tail risk. Um, this uh, kernel estimation, I don't think any econometrician would use a kernel estimation to estimate the tail. They would rather use uh, extreme value theory and uh, try to estimate the decay of, uh, uh, the rate of decay of the distribution. So once you do that, my feeling, especially if you incorporate data up to the Great uh, uh, Depression, is that your estimate would be much less sensitive to the, uh, to the tail event. And uh, would that have an implication also for the prediction of your macro model? Thank you. Your neighbor? Yeah. Um, also on the Great Depression. Uh, <laughs> the Great Depression must have uh, come as a surprise to those who experienced it and must have led to uh, an update in, in, in people's uh, perceived distributions. Why didn't we see the same pattern? After the Great Depression, if you if if you were, had extended the the your your uh, time your plot to to a Great Depression, you would see that you know the the economy reverts back to trend, and not only that, but it even overshoots it a, a, a linear trend. Okay, the gentleman behind you. Thank you. Uh, I someone already said. I think what we all learned was that. That's why I'm convinced that's my narrative. What we learn is that, that we were not on the trend we thought we were on. Mm -hmm. Now, this is very controversial yeah. by some, but I think it's, it's a compelling case. And there is no, uh, so I don't really understand why you said it couldn't be a surprise about TFP. I mean, I think a good, strong narrative is that during the boom, we overestimated uh, uh, um, TFP, and then we realized that we did. And now we're on a different trend. Mm -hmm. uh, now, your result, your construction is excellent on explaining the fact that we understand now the downside of such mistake, and you see it in the asset price data. But I think this interpretation is, uh, is much easier to square with other facts. Mm -hmm. So I don't understand why you say you didn't want this to be a surprise about TFP. Maybe you can explain. Okay, thank you very much. Any any more questions, comments? No, I don't see any for the moment, so Laura, okay. the floor is yours. So first I wanna thank Alberto for a very thoughtful and very generous discussion. Um, uh, I think asset prices are tough to look at because they're a mix of things. For, remember firms here are delevering when risk goes up. They're reducing debt. Right? And so that's going to affect equity prices. It's going to make equity more valuable. On the other hand, you've got more risk. So you've got these two things moving in opposite directions. It's really hard to just look at price levels for either debt or equity and figure out what's going to happen when the mix changes. The truth is it could go either way with a slightly different calibration, and that's why we don't want to rely on it. The VIX is low. The VIX is not uncertainty. The VIX is volatility. Volatility is not high in this model. It's high at the time of the financial crisis, and then it's low again. Um, the question of, do we know that we don't know? No. In this paper, they re-estimate the distribution and then take that as truth. Is that ideal? No. Uh, it would be a lot harder model to do. And I'll tell you, we did some experiments with 
thinking about what if tomorrow you had a different distribution, what if two periods from now you had a different distribution, and, and sampling all of those and seeing how different the policies were, and there were, there were very minute differences. But one thing we would miss that's important, and actually this is based on work Pierre Colin Dufresne here has done, which is if you know that estimates of a model are uncertain, it's a source of long-run risk. So if we had a model where long-run risk were an important determinant of asset prices, that's where that assumption that we are, acknowledge our uncertainty about future distributions would, would bite. Okay? It would introduce knowledge of a new martingale. Um, what if policy beliefs change? Would that change things? Yes. And in fact, that would be the role for policy here, would be to have some policy that actually changed people's beliefs about the possibility of future tail events. If you could implement something that credibly removed the tail risk, that would be effective here. But that's a big if. Um, thank you for the suggestion uh, about uh, the marginal value shocks. Uh, why did the Great Depression not last? I'd say World War II. Um, I, I don't know that I have much more to say about that. There, there certainly was some persistence of that shock. It dragged out for a while, and, and then we entered a pre-war phase. Um, and then lastly, why, why didn't we do this for TFP? So two problems with TFP. One is the measured productivity shocks during this period were actually rather small, uh, so we wouldn't get a lot of kick out of it. And the second is we wanted this to be consistent with asset prices because we wanted to use asset price data, options data, to, uh, as, as over-identifying moments, as, as evaluations of, of the theory. And most TFP-driven models are very difficult to reconcile uh, with asset prices. Um, this, the, one of the reasons that Francois Guriot wrote this model is that these capital quality shocks allow for there to be large variations um, in, uh, in the returns to capital that with, with not so much macro volatility. And it's very difficult. I don't know whether these marginal value of capital shocks do that. They may. I'd, I'd have to look into that. But, but this was specifically constructed to have some meaningful uh, thoughts about asset prices. That being said, no paper no paper explains all the ups and downs of the asset market. We're, that's, that's an impossible barrier. I will not say that this tells us why we have such as high asset prices today. I, there are a lot of things going on in the world, and this is just hopefully one of them. OK, thank you very much. Any? Yes, another one, please. <laughs> uh, so coming back to my point before. Okay. So I think when you say that the estimated TFP shocks were too small to have any action is because of the way they were estimated, did okay. not really allow the possibility that we had a mistake for several years running during the credit boom, mm -hmm. misunderstanding, overspending with borrow money for something that we attribute to be uh, actually TFP. Mm -hmm. So I think if we were to redo that calculation, uh, it wouldn't be clear at all that the shocks were the surprise, mm -hmm. perhaps was we thought for a number of years we were growing because there was rising productivity. Actually, we were just borrowing and spending. Mm -hmm. Now, if you recalculate the path, then you come to a different estimate of what might have been a mistake. Mm -hmm. I think that's, uh, I mean, not everybody knows I'm not an empiricist, but I think this is, uh, this, someone should do it. That's possible. I did not want to invent a new way of measuring TFP. We took standard measures. We took utilization adjusted. Those, those didn't seem to work what you don't know. Okay. So if we have the wrong way to measure because we have the wrong expectation, and the, and the wrong inference, okay. and everybody does, and everybody spends, and therefore, if everybody were right, our measure would be right. Then we discover we were wrong, that's the real discovery, and that's what produced the value. Now, that's something you can do with your framework, I think. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Lee. Take you back to your paper, Laura. So, um, so there seemed to be sort of two thoughts, as you said. Uh, there was maybe a minority that th thought that there may be another crisis in the making. Uh -huh. um, so I'm thinking sort of about, you know, Ulrike Momondier's work on depression babies and the like. Um, so, could we? I know that, that. I mean, you looked. Uh, there were some questions already on what, what happens if we were to extend the. Uh, the period to the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. But could we use your framework to actually sort of estimate um, how much memory loss there is in society? Uh -huh. um, right. I so think you could do that, no? And I, yeah. Because it's something that has intrigued me. Um, 
I think there are two camps there, but maybe one is very small and the other is very large, but maybe you could fit the data somehow. So we, we did some experiments where we discount old data. The behavioral foundations of that are a little questionable, uh, but you know it is a question that comes up and it seemed an exercise worth doing. Uh, the short answer is about 1% per year discounting seems to generate uh, if we then include the fact that there, was, there has been a financial crisis before in the Great Depression, that seemed to square with the size of the decline that, that we saw. Okay, so much about the Alzheimer effect of society. Um, any, any more questions? One more, please. I think uh, also demographics uh, should matter in the sense that, I mean, if you have uh, reshuffling a population that is growing very fast, uh, you know, uh, the average uh, memory uh, should become shorter and shorter. So that is related also to the um, uh, why the Great Depression uh, was uh, showing uh, uh, less persistent, perhaps because the growth of population was faster at the time. And the other is that um, prior to the Great Depression, there, there were other rare events that were in the memory of people that were uh, faced with the Great Depression, whereas you know the uh, this Great Recession was preceded by the Great Moderation, so people were forgetting because of the Great Moderation. So, I think all these features seems to be consistent. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Blanchard. Yeah. Uh, on the Great Depression and the equity premium, if you compute the ex-ante equity premium from 1929 on, mm -hmm. basically went up enormously just after the great you know, after the fall in the stock market mm -hmm. between Makes eight sense. and ten percent at that time mm -hmm. and then it slowly went down for about 30 years and there's a, a well-known saying by Paul Samuelson which is that basically the uh, you know the memories of the equity premium disappeared one death at a time yes. and so I, I think it's very relevant to what you discussed yes, yes. thank you okay thank you very much uh, I don't see any more. So I thank uh, both uh, Laura and Alberto for the paper and for the, for the discussion and all of you who asked uh, questions. And uh, so I think uh, we learn now how transitory, even very small, unlikely events, uh, but extreme events uh, can change beliefs and uh, also change macro outcomes. But at least this institution, as it was said, as a policy institution, tries to change the beliefs of the people again. And uh, we as statisticians uh, hopefully uh, supply all the data to change the beliefs uh, in this sense so that you don't uh, have wrong beliefs. Uh, with that, uh, we move to coffee break. Uh, there are 22 minutes till uh, 16.45 and the next uh, session will start. So enjoy your coffee and thanks again for, for your questions and contributions. Thank you.